Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 17th, 2022, and this is the week in charts. I'm sure I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Thank you so much. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that, your questions on trading. And if you're interested in crypto, we have been looking at crypto lately, although crypto has been in a pretty ugly bear market, so I can't imagine you'll like too much there, but we'll pull it up. If you want, just put a dollar sign in front of anything you want. So working title for tonight is Sign Signals in a 30,000 Foot View. I want to talk about what's going on with the markets, show you a little system I played around with today, update some other systems and signals and such. And even though I've said a few of these things before, I think they bear repeating. And I think kind of reminds me of, as I was getting ready for the show, kind of reminds me of when... Uh, Anthony Robbins once said that he talked about a preacher that gave the same sermon over and over. And one week, one of the parishioners said, hey, I can't uh, help but notice there that you keep saying the same thing. He's like, yeah, I'm going to keep saying the same thing till you people get it. So not you people that are here live tonight, because most of you here tonight, I think, have been around for a while. I can't see everybody here, but I know a lot of people from the Facebook group are here. But in general, there's a lot of people that refuse to believe in what they see when these things come around. Anyway, the disclaimer screen just went by. As I could, I could easily sum it up. All predictions about the future. A lot of stuff could happen between now and then. Now, when it comes to talking about potential bear market in the works, keep in mind, I'm just a messenger, and I really hope that I'm wrong, and some of these things just don't work out. It has been preaching quite a bit. Market timing is less about beating the market and more about not letting the market beat you. If that's the first time you've heard me say that, when you see some of these big slides that have happened over the years, it should ring true if you've never lived through one of those. When I was putting things together, I got to thinking about something that G.C. Selden said years ago. As I say quite often, I probably have about six hard copies of his books laying around. I'm surprised I can't reach one from here. Uh, anyway, it's a little short book, Psychology of Stock Markets, and you can get it for free on the internet or, like I do, just buy a, a hard copy or soft copy so you have it around. Anyway, I thought this kind of dovetailed nicely into everything that I'm saying tonight and have been saying lately. And, and one thing I was thinking about is that, as I was putting together that slide a few minutes ago, actually, hey, I'm just a messenger and I hope I'm wrong. If I am wrong, then I'm going to look to get long more and more stocks and short less and less or maybe not at all. And I haven't really shorted a whole lot in this cycle just yet. And so far, really haven't made much money, maybe broken even at best on the short side. And we had a couple of stinkers in the core methodology, uh, the trading service, I should say. But anyway, I'm OK with going where the money is if the money's on the upside the money's on the downside and if it's sideways i'm going to sit on my hands like we often do and one thing i would encourage you to do is go in and look at the archives and trading service and you'll see everything warts and all so we cannot be judged by our sophistries markets the market is let me start over the market is relentless it cannot be budged by our sophistries it will respond exactly to the forces and personalities which are working upon it with no more regard for our opinions than if we couldn't vote. We cannot work for our own interests as in other lines of business. We can only fit our interests to the facts. To make the greatest success, it is necessary for the trader to forget entirely his own position in the market as profits or losses, the relation of present prices to the point where he bought or sold, that's sunk cost right there, and to fix his thoughts upon the position of the market. If the market is going down, the trader must sell, no matter whether he has a profit or a loss, whether he bought a year or two or two minutes ago. Well, provided that it's going past your stop. Obviously, there's a few little caveats to some of this, but you kind of get the gist of what's what he's saying. If the market continues going up like it did today and could it mount a little bit of an uptrend for a while, then we'll start getting long in areas outside of energies and metals, which we've been buying lately. Now, this morning, I woke up 
and started thinking about the VIX. I know you want to party with me and, you know, Dave, what do you think about in the mornings has changed, <laughs> has changed. Anyway, I was thinking kind of along the lines of the CBR3 modified system, which I didn't bother looking up before I got started. And I knew how it worked in general, the back of my mind. I knew you had to get the VIX stretched more than 10% away from the 10 day simple moving average. And then that's, you get a buy signal when you get like a reversal, close below the open for a buy and close above the open for a sell. So down here, I have these lines roughly at 10%. So when the VIX gets stretched one way or the other, and closes below its open, provided it is still 10% above its simple moving average, its 10 day simple moving average, and the low is also greater than that moving average. So let me show you a signal, and then I'll show you a couple of things here. So again, anything above this line here, here's 10% round numbers, anything above 10%, and you're looking for a close less than the open, okay? And this is gonna be a buy signal. And you can see right here, I put these little funny looking charts on here so you might be able to see, or so you will be able to see the close and the open more clearly. So you're looking for a, I guess, red candle is what the terminology would be. And you would exit when the price bar intersects the moving average. So you'd exit in this particular case right here for a nice little pop. By the way, just in case you hadn't figured it out, this orange line in the background is the S&P 500. So I wanted to just go back to the beginning of the year because the market obviously has gotten iffy between then and now. And by accident, I went back an extra year and I was kind of surprised at how well it worked. It didn't print money, but it did okay with only four losses during that entire time. So that's 82% correct. Well, let's not start kissing each other just yet anytime you design a system and think you have something go in and play devil's advocate what could go wrong so the first thing that came to my mind is what happened to this during the pandemic well the first buy signal was right here and the exit was right there and if you look at the S&P underneath, it actually did okay on that first buy signal during the slide. Now, here's your next buy signal, but unfortunately the market was absolutely imploding at that time. And let's zoom in a little bit to see the signal. So the signal was here, okay? So I say sell, that should be buy right here. And then you sell up here where the X is, again, when it crosses moving average. Well, that would have been, this sell should point down here. So you would have exited down here. You would have bought here and exited down here. So that would have been a really ugly trade. There were some ugly trades way back then. Now, just a couple of things real quick. While doing research, make sure that you're not reading their wheel. I dug out my copy of Dave Landry on swing trading, which Shoot, it was written 20 years ago, 22 years ago. Oh my God, I'm gonna go. <laughs> and I noticed this little system that I just kind of pulled out the air is a CVR3. Now I went through it kind of quickly. If you want the system, you can get my book from DaveLander.com slash free dash book. And I'll put that link in post to make sure I've got it correct and all. But when I, again, when I looked at, looked it up at Dave Landry on Swing Trade, and I realized that's exactly a CVR3, okay? <laughs> Got a copy, aging well, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I don't feel like it. <laughs> oh, you guys are so nice. Thank you. <laughs> now, one thing I do recommend, and I don't do a whole lot of programming anymore, and I used to program a lot of systems back in the day. And it could be a bit of a rabbit hole once you start doing that. 
and I'm kind of anti-mechanical, but had I not did all that research 20 something years ago, I would not be a discretionary trader. But even if you don't have ways to program this stuff in, I would recommend that you hand test the stuff. You're gonna see a lot of things that the computer kind of just glosses over. For instance, you'll see the good, the bad, and the ugly. You'll see near miss signals. And through the process, you might come up with some sort of whipsaw filter or some sort of protection. Now, I stopped short of trying to come up with a filter for, okay, well, you're in a pandemic and the market's going straight down, or more correctly, the market all of a sudden took the pandemic seriously. It's sort of going straight down. Don't catch that falling knife. Rather than do something like that or add a moving average or whatever. It's like, well, let's just leave it alone. And because I'm not going to trade this mechanically, but I will pay attention to it. And by the way, in case you're wondering why I woke up and did this, whenever the market gets a little iffy, I tend to dust off these old systems just to see what's happening in current times. Now, one thing you have to be really careful of is be careful not to curve fit. Many, many, many years ago, I helped people program systems. And if something didn't work, they would kind of hint at ways to maybe try to make it work, or I would figure out a way to make it work. And that's a little dangerous because the the more layers you put upon that, and the better and better and better to make you make that system look, the more you have curved fit it to the past. And that's why I like a simple system. And I think the TFM 10% system is something really simple and it does work. And we'll flesh that out in a little more detail in a few minutes. Now, one thing that I didn't fully wrap my head around 20 something years ago, and, and you know, what is it, uh, Ancora, Emporo, or however, however the, uh, the Greek or Latin is said, but Michelangelo at 80 years old or 80 something said he's still learning. And, and in this business, we learn every day. We really do. These uh, <laughs> people who claim to know it all, believe me, they don't. And if they tell you they're the best trader in the world, you might go visit them in prison soon because they're lying. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far. But one thing I didn't wrap my head around years ago, the problem with short-term systems, they sound good on paper, okay? Oh, well, it's a short-term system. It, it, you're early in the market for a few days, maybe a week max. Well, a lot of stuff can happen in that one week, especially on the downside. So the problem with short-term systems is that there is a potential for unlimited gain. There is no potential for unlimited gains and you could always lose plenty in a short amount of time. So as you saw in that pandemic, that would wipe out many, many, many years of gains. By the way, the VIX is a reversion to the mean type of market. You're better off trading reversion to the mean than trend following in the VIX. Although maybe I should mess around a little bit with some trend following, maybe like a two bar high, two bar low type of system might actually work. But in general, when the VIX gets stretched one way or the other, it tends to bounce back and the market has a corresponding move. And Larry Connors taught me this in, I guess, the mid 90s. And then I helped him develop some systems based on, on some of those things. And that's where the CBR3 modified came from. So be careful with a short term system. That's why I use a hybrid approach. I trade for short term gains but I'm willing to stick around for longer term gains. And we've got one in the portfolio. I always forget when I trigger, but I think we've been in it for a year and a half. So be careful with anything short term that does not allow for unlimited gains. And again, play devil's advocate with any system. And I've seen, believe me, I've seen so much stuff over the years. This person, I'm sure I said this before, but I'll say it again, approached me many, many years ago. And I think it was in 1995, maybe, or 1996. And anyway, they, he in particular, just printed off reams and reams and reams and reams of paper and made these big bound books. And he thought he had this system. And he had all the rules for the system. And what he did was he curve fit tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons, and tons of rules for the system. And one of them was like on a moving average tick up, you would you would buy. 
Well, what he didn't realize was the way the chart worked, the moving average, let's say the moving average was here and the next price was here, but you couldn't see that price just yet. The moving average would go from here to here. So you would see that moving average upticking before you saw that actual tick. So make sure you do a lot of hand testing and make sure you really look at what's really happening. And with anything like this, I think this research is, is worthy, although it can be a rabbit hole, but just use the concept to your advantage. So if that VIX starts getting really, really stretched, maybe I wanna go in and trade the VIX outright, but be careful doing that because that's a big can of worms. And a lot of the derivatives of derivatives of derivatives of derivatives, such as these VIX ETFs, might not work exactly like you think they work. And it's not enough time to get into that, but if it's a VIX futures and a derivative off of that, it, it just it's just a huge can of worms and doesn't always act like you should. And Larry, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this, Larry, Larry McMillan once mentioned to me that he's seen people on CNBC talk about these things and he says they've got it absolutely wrong. And these are people that should know better. But anyway, use the concept to your advantage. Don't go crazy mechanical. When you see that VIX just super stretched away from the moving average, and let's say you're short to the hilt, maybe it's a good time to start lightening up a little bit. I wouldn't rush out and buy anything, but start lightening up a little bit and realize that the market's getting ready to correct the other way. Now, of course, use some common sense. If you go back and look at the, the trade that failed miserably in there or the trades that failed miserably in there, you would have been buying a market going straight down. And obviously that would be a bad idea. Instead of doing that, maybe if you were longer term trend following, hold on to those positions and say, hey, you know what? I made a lot of money over a short period of time. Maybe I might want to lighten up a little bit. Craig says, trade the VIX like anything else, follow the chart. Yeah, what I would recommend though is with the chart, just, just treat it a little bit more like a reversion to the mean market than trend following in general. So I wanna do a quick update on the TFM 10% system. And notice that now we are back above the green line and back above the, the green line is the buy line, by the way which is 10% away from the 50 week closing high. So take this number here and take 10% away from that or easier way of doing is just 90% of that close. And that'll give you the, the buy line, so to speak. In, in order to buy the market, you need to be above the buy line, above the 50 week moving average, and also you need two lows above both of those too, okay? So actually you just need two lows above both of those. So right here, one, two, and a close above two lows. Let me rewind that. Such a simple system, always get tripped up. Two lows above the 50 week moving average, that's Landry Light, and a close above the buy line. So here was your buy right here. This was your sell during the pandemic and notice that the market didn't implode right away. That's one thing you gotta watch for. The market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people, to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. And, and these are, I'm borrowing from Linda Rasky. It will do what it has to do. It will do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people, cause the most amount of pain and it will also often, and I guess I just kind of add that word in there, often do the obvious in an unobvious manner. So if this thing is gonna roll over, it's gonna look like it's rolling over, but it's gonna have a big retrace rally first. It's gonna make all the buy and hold people feel pretty good about not getting out. Three weeks ago when I told my buddies, we had a sell signal in the TFM 10% system on a, rolling bar basis, but I consider it a sell signal. And I'll show you where to find that in one second. And, you know, one of them said, oh, my guys made me a lot of money. Uh, I talked to him and he said, he's getting more aggressive now that the market's lower. I'm like, oh crap, that's gonna work until it don't. And 
I guarantee you this thing goes up a little bit further. He's going to start feeling better and better about his position. Now, the signal we had last Friday was a calendar signal as opposed to a rolling signal. And without going into a lot of details on that and boring you too much, I know, too late. I put this little bear market updates on my website. If you click there, you can get the day that it triggered. I think it was on the 22nd or 23rd. Don't quote me on that, but it's in the article. And then the calendar one obviously was last Friday. Now, just because we're back above the line doesn't mean you should rush out and buy. If you haven't sold yet, you might want to think about it just in case, okay? Now, the reason you want to think about it just in case is where bad things happen. Now, it was, I have to, I'm, I'm trying to see their names so I can say them right. Uh, Gaird and Bilio, I think, uh, wrote a paper years ago or did a presentation or something. I think they won some kind of award for it. And it was called Where Bad, where bad where bad things happen. I don't know what's wrong tonight. Maybe need some water. <laughs> and they were talking about the 200 day moving average. And you see, you've seen me do presentations before where I showed that bad things happen below the 200. Well, the same thing is true for the buy line or the 10% line, okay? If a market again is gonna drop, as I say often, from new highs, all the way down to let's say 50% or more, it's gonna drop 10% first. So if it drops 10%, and in this case, the market will be the S&P 500, the, the buy line might be a total different percentage and it would have to be adjusted to volatility for, for other markets, but 10% is a good round number and it works really well from what I've seen in the S&P 500 going back 100 and something years, 125 years I think is the testing that I've done. But you can see, not all the time, but occasionally bad things really, really, really happen or really can happen once the market begins to weaken. And by the way, notice that we dropped below the buy line here and we had this kickback up here, okay? This is a weekly chart. So this is weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And that's a point I'm gonna reiterate in a few minutes. You do have time, okay? But not a limited time to get out of the way. And you can see the pandemic slide right here. And even though you could argue that, oh, it was a whipsaw because it came right back, the market was down 30 something percent. I think it dropped 30 percent or more after the signal, okay? 30 something percent total, but 30 percent after the signal. The diaper change, I think, was 29 percent in change. And the diaper change is how far the market drops after you get out okay because if you the reason i say diaper chain stealing that phrase from ian mccaffity mccaffity he's up there messing with me i know <laughs> he's a he was a trip <laughs> he used to he, he wasn't really a heavy drinker but he drank he drank enough a substantial amount and he smoked like a chimney and it's like i'm like i was thinking man this guy's my canary in the coal mine and unfortunately he's no longer with us like oh crap i better I better start watching my lifestyle a little bit. So I've been showing this chart quite a bit. And all I did was invert the percent change. So obviously that's a great depression down about 80%. And people are like, well, that was in, this is now. And I know I've said this a thousand times, but nobody hears me, okay? Uh, <laughs> anyway, if you have children, it's like a friend of mine, you should always say, you don't hear me. It's like I started telling my kids that, you don't hear me. <laughs> Get off my lawn. Uh, anyway, the NASDAQ in 2000 lost 77% of its value. And if you look at the actual chart, I think it was 50%, then it dropped another 55% from that level. So it lost half and half again. And that's that's kind of a, a crazy thing to wrap your head around. But anyway, the 2020 pandemic, or when the market took the pandemic seriously, I should say, you, you could see it was a pretty serious drop, over 30%. And you could obviously pick out the bear markets in here. Now, it doesn't mean that once we drop 10%, it's gonna keep on dropping. Maybe 10% is, is just it, and we might be okay. But you might wanna pay attention when that occurs. And the other thing is, just because you haven't lived through something doesn't mean it can happen. I'm sorry, it doesn't mean it can't happen. 
and I was watching a little bit of DeLeo's uh, video that he did on, I think it's called Changing World Order, and we're the reserve currency for the world right now, and he shows how different powers rise up over the years, and it's like, it kind of scared the bejesus out of me, and it made me realize that, wow, you know, I'd already put this slide together, but yeah, just because you haven't lived through something doesn't mean that it can't happen. And then a couple of days after watching that, it's like all of a sudden the Saudis are like, you know what, China, y'all could just pay us in, in China dollars and the yuan, you know, we're good with that. It's like, well, wait a minute, this is a little bit of that un potential unraveling. So that's kind of scary. I know I'm confusing the issue with facts. And keep in mind, something like that might take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, or a few weeks. <laughs> God forbid. Anyway, I'd recommend you watch that video. Now, simple trend following. One of you guys in the group pointed out, it might have been John, I think, pointed out that the S&P or the spiders had a weekly bow tie to the downside. I haven't seen that just yet, but this is the weekly chart for the S&P 500. If it's green down here, as I say quite often, it means that the 10 simple is greater than the 20 exponential, and the 20 exponential is greater than the 30 exponential, as I call it, proper order, okay? So that's the proper order of the moving averages. When they are meandering back and forth, it's yellow. Might You might be in a choppy market. And when it turns red, you're in a questionable environment. Now, I remember, I remember 2016. 2016 was not a good time. It was pretty ugly markets, a lot uglier than it looks in this chart because of the scaling. Anyway, you can see it's mostly green here, and what the market do? Mostly went up. So good time to be long. Obviously, 2019, we had a little bit of a spill, and we went to downtrend proper order. I can't imagine if you're a longer term trend follower that you would have held through that. And if you did, you must have had some super wide stops because you've been in forever. And again, the pandemic slide, obviously we flipped over, but this was really late. By the time the signal triggered, the market was already on its way back up. So that's one caveat when it comes to using moving averages. Now, as I've said before, a little lag sometimes is, is good. Sometimes can be good. It keeps you from chasing your own tail. And in a case like this, if the market makes a gradual rollover and you get one of those major signals, even though every time the market doesn't come unglued, although every time it's done it in this particular chart over the past, what's that, seven years, it's been a little ugly, right? But I think it, I think it's something that pays to pay attention. Again, especially when you get a gradual rollover. We've been mostly green ever since, and I'll zoom this in. And you can see we're trying to start crossing over now. Now, John, if you're here tonight, I think I saw you earlier. Uh, where were you seeing a bow tie in the weekly? And I'll just continue while you figure that out. Again, it turns yellow once they begin crossing over. So you can see the 10 cross the 20, and it also cross the 30 EMA, okay? So the 10 is in downtrend proper order. I'm sorry, the 10 has made the crossing, but the other two has it, haven't made the crossing just yet. So when those other two cross over, it'll be in downtrend proper order. Now, notice that we closed above the 10 simple. If we close above the 20 and the 30, okay, 20 EMA, 30 EMA, the moving average will turn up. Greg Morris taught me that. And when I started asking questions about it, he shut me down and said, it's mathematics. So I was like, okay. <laughs> but Greg tells you something, you just listen, okay? Because he's never been wrong from, from, from what I've seen. Anyway, so that moving average will turn up if we get above it. And we're really not that far away from getting above it. But you can see that they were trying to roll over. And as long as we stay below it, we will, it will roll over, guaranteed, okay? Oh, okay, uh, John said last week's last week show was really just noting that we're getting close and not to forget about the good the good of bow ties, good old bow ties. Yeah, okay, not, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so what he's saying was we're getting close, and you're right. In, in fact, you, you're the one that kicked me off. It's all coming back to me now. 
Uh, you're the one that kicked me off on this looking at the weekly bow tie kick, right? I used to show them like in every show until somebody said, stop showing them in every show. It's like, well, they, they work. They, they, they're kind of cool. It's not the greatest thing to slice bread, but it can help you. Help to keep you on the right side of the market. Anyway, I was talking about lag earlier. Okay, green is good, right? Tarzan speak, green, good. But notice that the moving averages did begin to roll over for quite some time. So even though we're still green, at least we were up until about two weeks ago, the market had already begun to roll over. Now, let's say the market turns right back up, then that lag obviously was a good thing, but you need to look at more than one thing, obviously dailies, weeklies, and of course, Landry Light and stuff like that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the tech crowds. Now, some of this might be repetitive because I did talk about some of these things in my stock chart show, a lot of slides tonight come from that show but i think it bears repeating the death cross in and of itself it isn't in the end of the world but it's another one of those things where bad things happen as i preach if you traded the death cross mechanically it probably wouldn't work that well i think rob Hanna, who does a lot of mechanical type of testing and programming said that it's about a four percent edge don't quote me on that but if memory serves it wasn't a big enough edge to make it worth trading but if you go in, and, and I think in 2015, I did a presentation on the death cross. And my point there was the magnitude of what happens. It's kind of like the where the bad things happen. Well, we already know bad things happen below the 200-day moving average, right? Well, when you have the death cross, then sometimes some really ugly things can happen below that. And I think in that show, I showed, if memory serves, the magnitude of what happens. So anyway, officially, we have a death cross. And when it comes to the magnitude, this is where you got to pay attention. And if you just go back to 2008, and by the way, I know I say this quite often, but it's just kind of a cool thing. I remember way back in 2000 and when was it 2007, I couldn't find a setup to save my life, and we ended up starting a short. And then, of course, the, we know what happens next. So the market internally sort of coming unglued. But with moving averages, any moving averages, I, I like my stuff a lot, but other people's stuff is good too. And most trend following stuff will kind of look alike, by the way, okay? And most breakout stuff will look alike and most oscillator stuff will look alike. Anyway, with the moving averages, because they, there's a lag in them, they work really, really well when the market itself takes, takes its own sweet time about rolling over like it did back in 2008. Anyway, there's your death cross right there. And you can see what happened. It actually had a little bit of a throwback, so to speak, to the moving average, the 200 day moving average. And then the market, of course, as you know, imploded in earnest. It lost 55% of its value from that death cross. Will the market use lose 50% of its value this time? I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. <laughs> this is like, I used to, I always go in the house and get a white cup. So um, it looks, it tends to look nicer on camera, right? But I always keep my honey badger water cup. Honey badger don't care. <laughs> anyway. Anybody remember that? So here's a death cross going back to the pandemic. And you could see your signal day to the low was only a couple of down days there. So it really didn't do too good of a job of warning you of things to come. But hey, the TFM 10% system, which I thought was a longer term system, triggered before the daily bow tie went to downtrend proper water. So I think it's important to pay attention to all of these signals, but don't sit around and wait for some kind of longer term signal. However, if you do get a longer term signal, then you really might want to pay attention. And I was trying not to say it tonight, but I'll say it again. As Greg Morris was visiting, I told me once when he was visiting, he said, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration but losing half your retirement, that's gonna hurt a little bit unless you've got a, a shit ton of money. <laughs> but you can see the market turning around and sort of going up, even though you were in a death cross. 
losses. And you can see also, if you were to take these signals mechanically short here and then buy here, that signal would have failed miserably. So take it all with a grain of salt, okay? That's a golden cross for those keeping score. But do pay attention when these things occur. And just like the 2008, 2009 bottom, even though it did bottom out for a while, the moving averages were still at a fairly high level. We, we saw a plethora of other signals turning up before then. I know somebody's gonna comment. Thanks for using the word plethora, it means a lot. Stay the light, the light is good. <laughs> Gotta add Landry to that. Stay in the Landry light, the light is good. Don't wait to tell me I had to put my name on something. <laughs> Who's that guy, John Bollinger? Why is he famous? He put his name on something. Well, put your name on something. Okay. <laughs> Met across from him at a, met him in Italy. <laughs> so he's a good guy, by the way. Anyway, uh, Landry light highs less than the moving average and downside. Pick your favorite moving average. A few weeks ago, I know you want to party with me once again. I did a presentation on simple versus exponential. I really like the 30 exponential on a daily chart, but simple works fine too. Simple has a little bit more lag. It might keep you from chasing your tail as much. I like the way the 30 turns a little quicker. And like I just said, as Greg taught me, notice that it flipped up today, actually flipped up yesterday. Why? Well, it cl we closed above it, okay? But you see, we went from Landry light to downside to no Landry light. So that is one glimmer of hope, okay? It's one glimmer of hope that we close above the 30 EMA. Sorry, I can't remember. Is a TFM system moving average, simple or exponential? It's a simple, John. It's a 50 week simple moving average so if you want to look at that on a daily chart what's five times five 25 so it'd be 250 days on a daily chart but it's a 50 week and the reason i use a simple was i it was a, it's kind of a whipsaw type of filter and i didn't want to be in and out in and out in and out you know like the or banging on the keyboard whatever trading the system like the the rat going for the cocaine but for a trader type, I think the EMA, something like 30 EMA is a great EMA to use. As I've been showing over and over again, the 30 EMA in, in, in crypto is just absolutely amazing. Keep you out of a lot of trouble. And we'll pull up crypto in a second too. Anyway, we're we're down to zero, okay? As I preach, and you know, I'm gonna have to unstick somebody on the back end of the website. I promise you over the next few weeks to month or so, somebody's gonna get hung up in the module and tell me that it's wrong. <laughs> because I've got a trick question in there. I ask if this measures magnitude. It does not measure magnitude. It tells you the number of days the lows are above the moving average or highs or below the moving average for uptrends and downtrends respectively. You can see mostly green back here and the market went mostly up, okay? It did get a little iffy last fall, as you probably remember if you've been trading since then. And then we went back to mostly green and then obviously mostly red and a little bit of, we got back to zero now. Now this is a longer term chart with the 30. And I just want to show you that in general, green, good, red, bad, okay? Just don't lose sight of it. And that's why I mentioned 30,000 foot view. And that's been in my head a lot lately. Take a 30,000 foot view with a lot of this stuff, okay? Look at that weekly TFM system, okay? And then notice that we're back above it. We're within 10% of the closing highs, okay? So that's a good thing, but you might wanna pay attention because we, we did have a sell. But again, you can see red, bad, green, or mostly green, good. And then now we're back to red. And of course, with today's action, we're back to zero. But we're still, I would consider that mostly red, okay? Kind of like Princess Bride, mostly dead. <laughs> so I did a presentation a few weeks back, as I just said, with the simple moving average versus the exponential. The simple is gonna be a little slower, fewer signals, possibly less whipsaw but it's also gonna take a little while to get you out, but you can see same sort of concepts really apply, mostly green, little red, things get iffy, and then back to green. And by the way, one thing I do like about the Landry light is 
you're not waiting for a moving average across another moving average, which which might take some time. Like I just said, again, I'm still amazed at how fast it triggered because the market sort of implode during that pandemic slide. So price will get below the moving average to get your signal. But again, mostly green, little red. I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse on this, but I think it bears repeating. Mostly green, mostly green, and then we had a little red lately. And I think we're still into red with the 50-day moving average. We'll pull it up when we get the live charts. So a little questionable there. Not the end of the world just yet, nor can you see it from here, but pays to pay attention. Daily bow tie, for the most part, mostly green up. Okay, some red, pay attention. Mostly green, good, okay. And then of course, mostly red down. And that's just the proper water. We're down 10, less than 20, less than 30. If you zoom in a little bit, on a weekly chart, I think I've already showed this, but you can see that the weekly has begun to cross and thank you, John, for pointing that out. And if we stay below them, if we stay below those moving averages, they will cross fairly soon. Now here's the thing with bear markets, and this is another thing that I picked up from Greg. You always get something good from Greg, right? And occasionally a eighth grade humor type of joke, but that's that's good too, right? <laughs> we can't take ourselves too seriously. One thing that's kind of interesting, it's kind of um, you know, soothing is the right word, but it kind of makes you feel pretty good, is you do have some time. You don't have unlimited time, but you have some time, okay? So if markets make a new highs, you have nothing to worry about. If the market begins sliding a little bit, you have some time to kind of think things through and remember that the markets don't go up forever, okay? And I showed this chart a couple of weeks back in Trading Simplified, so I'll go through it pretty quick. All I did was take a daily chart and put the buy line in, which is 10% above the closing high for, in this case, 50 days. And you could see it took 33 days for the market to have a 10% loss. And it actually had a big throwback after that, okay? And this is obviously 2008. And all total to get back below that, or at least from the new highs, it took two and a half months. And we all know what happened next. So you do have time, but not unlimited time. You can see we have the high in 2022 okay back in february and then it took two months to dip below or i'm sorry it took about a month to dip below the 10 percent line and it took almost two months to actually close below that 10 percent line okay and now we're back above it which is great which i hope we go straight back up i really don't care you know Give me an up. What's it? Uh, Gary Callbaum once said, "Give me an uptrend, give me a downtrend, or give me a ticket to, to Tahiti." Now, again, 2020 was was brutal, and this might go a little bit against what Greg said, but you still had time, okay? And it'd be fun. I know you want to party with me, right? Once again, it'd be fun to go back in history and see how long it took the market to drop 10%. So it did get there in about a week, but we did have a little bit of throwback. And it was about two weeks or so before you were from the top to um, to actually close below the buy line again. Now, one thing I was pointing out recently is that even though the market did sort of implode quickly, when when it took the pandemic seriously, it did kind of lose some momentum and steam along the way, okay? And I don't remember specifically, but if you're really bored, you can go in and look at my trading services for January and February 2020, and I'd be willing to bet that, I sh that I, we saw, at least I hope we saw, some deterioration underneath, but it did take a little while to roll over. Now, one thing I thought it'd be important to do is look at the crash of 1987 
And you can see the market makes all time highs. And then it took two and a half months before it closed below the buy line or two and a half months to drop 10% on a closing basis. However, you want to look at that. So everybody talks about the crash, like, oh, crash, a crash, a crash. Well, the market was kind of coming unglued for a long time, slowly coming unglued is my point before it actually crashed. This looks like the, in fact, I know this is the depression. And you can see the market made an all-time high here. And before it closed 10% lower, it traded for a month, okay? And then it had a nice, nice bounce. The market will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. It will also do what it has to do to frustrate the most people. Right now, I think it's getting ready to roll back over, but it might go straight up first, okay? I know, I'll couch a little bit. No matter what it does, it looks, it looks, you know, I'm right. See, I told you it was going to bounce. See, I told you it was going to roll back over. <laughs> I, guess it, I guess if it doesn't eventually roll over, then I'm wrong. But it'll eventually roll over, believe me. Anyway, going back to 29, you can see it took about two months to close again below that buy line. So first month, it lost, it took a month to lose 10%, bounced, and then probably about another month in between before it actually closed down. And it also, you can see, it kind of made new highs and then kind of failed to make new highs for a long, long time. So the signs and signals were there. So again, some random thoughts. I think these are left over here. You have time, but not unlimited time. This is the biggie right here. And I, I keep saying, I got to talk about this. I got to talk about this. And I keep forgetting that. I have talked about this. I have talked about this. Retrace rallies will make you think that all is good in the world. Use them to lighten up, not as an all clear. Now, a lighten up, I mean, if you should have been out of a position, like I've got, or I have some clients that have been around a long, long time, and they've got positions they, they may have established long before me and been holding on forever, Amazon, Tesla, things like that. And... I've given them some levels to watch, obviously old lows and things like that and, and support, resistance, et cetera. So that's what I'm talking about. If you got some longer term holdings and you think you should have gotten out of them a long time ago, maybe not rush out and sell them right away, but like, okay, I'm gonna trail a stop higher and see what happens. And maybe you'll get lucky and go back right back to all time highs and that would be a great thing, right? This is one thing I can't say enough. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. I might get jerked around a little bit. I might get whipsawed a little bit by following these signals and signs, et cetera. And you know what? I might get frustrated. But borrowing a line from Greg again, or repeating Greg, I can survive frustration. Devastation is a little tougher. Now, here's the thing that I should tell a friend of mine's money manager, and I guess I'm getting myself in trouble when I try to help. I, when I try to help, you know, I'm in a lose-lose situation. If I try to help friends and family ahead of time, okay, the market goes on to make new highs and they just get pissed off at me. And they ignore me anyway. Like I just said, that the one friend, his guy's getting more aggressive. It's like, well, he doesn't know that sometimes it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. <laughs> and believe me, and, and the, the example I, I use often, as I just said, NASDAQ's down 50%, and then it drops another 50%. Now, this is something we talked about last week. Just want to kind of skim over real quick. And I've been guilty of these lately. Uh, another one of those that comes from Dalio. If you make a mistake and it's an actual mistake, okay, write it down. Um, I've been fat figuring a lot of stuff lately. I don't know why. I guess I'm getting caught up in the moment or whatever. And one thing I used to do, and I don't know why I quit doing it, and there's nobody here, it doesn't matter. I used to announce my orders out loud. Okay, I'm gonna buy to cover a thousand shares of X, Y, Z. Okay, I'll buy to close. 
or sell to close, to enter, okay? A couple of weeks ago, as I admitted, I'm gonna sell to close 2,000 shares. I closed 200. And guess what? Market opened down, you know, 100 S&P points or whatever it was a couple of Mondays ago. So I dropped a few F-bombs on that. <laughs> I'll drop another one now. There she is. Thank you, Mike. I know I get a lot of mileage out of that thing. Document, document, document. You know, today I took a couple of SG trades, but it wasn't for a lot of money. Should have done it. I don't know. Am I interviewing myself again? Yes. <laughs> but I wrote SG next to it. And one day I'll go through all those SG trades and realize it's probably not worth it. Also, when you're journaling your, your trading journal, for instance, I've started putting like a little E and circle in it if I'm having like an emotional reaction to something which I do quite often because I'm an emotional guy. And also you can't trade without emotions. And I've said that a thousand times. The other thing too, as far as journaling, journaling is concerned, I've said a thousand times, I'll say a thousand more. Best thing I've ever done in my life. One of the best things. I guess the best thing I've ever done was marry my, my beautiful bride, Marcy, just in case she's watching. Second best thing I've ever done was my morning pages. And I wake up every morning really early and write three handwritten pages. And a lot of good stuff comes from this. Sometimes nothing good comes from it, but so what? I get it out of my head. You know, it's like, okay, I did something stupid yesterday in my trading. I wrote that down this morning or day before, I forget when it was, try to forget it quickly, but I will write it down to remind myself not to do it again. All right, let's shift gears. Let's go to live charts. Everything I've been saying lately about crypto, nothing's really changed. This, this is slides video for a couple of months. So if you want to screenshot this, or better yet, yeah, just go in and watch presentations that I've done going back to when this bear market started and all the crypto. So I'm just going to pull up crypto real quick. And if you guys want to look at any pairs, let me know. Of course, I'll take a look at Bitcoin and one or two big ones or whatever. So this morning, I did a little walkthrough. And everything in blue was just stuff that was kind of rallying that I might want to pay attention to. And maybe some of these are making the turn. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet. Ethereum, I have some small long-term holdings in Ethereum and some small long-term holdings in Bitcoin. I know, I just kind of broke some rules there, right? But most of these things are in a bear market. And I was just kind of full disclosure there. So Bitcoin, you can see Bitcoin hasn't really taken off. And I saw somebody making excuses for why it hasn't taken off. It just it's it's just not taken off. It is what it is. And that's fine. Okay. But don't make excuses for it for not taking off with all that's going on in the world. Maybe someday it will. And maybe I've Drunk or drank the children drank lemon, drunk lemonade. That's wrong, right? Anyway, maybe I had a little bit of their Kool-Aid, you know, because I do have a tiny bit amount hodled in, in Bitcoin just for S and G's. But right now it's sideways at best, as you can see. And as I often preach, your 30 simple moving average is your best friend. I'm sorry, your 30 exponential moving average getting tripped up here is your best friend. Notice that Sheeb is way below it. So anything in blue is something I've been looking at one way or the other. This one's pulling back a little bit. I don't know how thin it is, but it might be worth going after. I'm short the ones in orange, YFI, S-O-L, D-A-O, and I'm long this one here, A-X-C. Notice the lows are greater than the moving average. I hate to say it, I'm gonna jinx myself, but this almost looks manipulated. Just goes up a little bit each day, a little bit each day. That's how they caught Bernie Madoff. His, his uh, equity curve looked like this. Doo, 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 doo. Little man on Price is Right, right? <laughs> so this is kind of scary. I, someday I might want to lighten up. I'm up. I don't have much, but someday I might want to lighten up, but it is kind of interesting that it just tends to go up and up and up and up and up. So I'll just put them in like alphabetical order just to show you real quick. Okay, Landry Light to the downside. 
most of these SIGs land your life at the downside below the 30 EMA. If you didn't know anything about crypto, don't buy anything below the 30 EMA, okay? But you can see, again, bear market going on here, most below the 30 EMA, the, the so-called shit coins, S-H-Y-T. These are the shit coins, all the ones, anything other than like uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin. And the purists just believe in Bitcoin only. All right, so enough of that. Any you guys want to look at any crypto in particular? You're smart if you don't, because there's really nothing to be done in crypto right now. So let me shift gears, and I'll get uh, I'll get my charts fired up. If you guys want to talk about some individual stocks, feel free to do so now. So let's take a look at the overall market real quick. I know we kind of already beat the dead horse on that. And I also want to take a look at a couple of sectors in here. And if you guys start giving me some stock picks, if you want, I know, as I say, ad nauseum, the Facebook group has kind of eliminated the stock picking, picking portion of this show, but that's fine. And then someday we'll get some, some new people in. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. Yeah, John, I like that one. I think it's in Landry list, but we'll we'll talk about it. We'll look at it. Okay, let's take a look at the, that's the tech class. I was playing with that earlier. I know you still want to party with me, right? So let's just throw 30 in, in here since it's my favorite at the time. 30 EMA and exponential. And let's make it orange and thick. All right, here we go. Okay. Lots of land to the downside. Obviously, big fat day today. Look at that. Big, nice day, a percent change. Again, I hope it goes straight up. Not until a couple of my shorts implode, but after that, it goes straight up. <laughs> but still, the downtrend, falling highs. One thing I talked about in the week of charts tonight, notice that every little kiss above, every little kiss or every little pivot point above the moving average has been met with lower highs, okay? Lower high, lower high, lower high, lower high, okay? So in order for an uptrend to form, what do we need? We need higher highs and higher lows. That's all you need. Let's take a look at bonds while we're down here. Bonds sold off a little bit today. Oh, you used to get a DLL error? Okay, gotcha. Oh, geez. Yeah, so it, so go to webinar, had a hiccup. Let's see if that's better now. Thanks for uh, thanks for the heads up. All right, you got it. All right, just real quick, uh, just back to the P's again. You've seen this before. Lower lower highs, okay. Lower highs and lower lows in all the pivot points so far above the moving average, and that's something you pay attention to. And not to just to avoid a DLL error. Let's not jump back to crypto, but if you get bored, go in and look at crypto and notice how many pairs have these falling pivot points, okay? You're welcome. Here's the dollar, okay? The dollar right now is a dog with these fleas, and the dollar is the world currency, okay? Until it's not. <laughs> you know, Saudi's saying, yeah, China, you could pay us in some wands. <laughs> what do you call them, wands? A wand? <laughs> you put an S on that? Anybody know? Anyway, I think I have some wands. No, I had Hong Kong dollars. A Hong Kong dollar is not a wand, is it? I got some Hong Kong dollars. I was in Hong Kong a while back. Shit, it's been years now. Jeez. Pandemic kind of mucked everything up. Anyway, uh, dollar. I hope the dollar hangs in there. I really do. I know you should never say hope in this business, but the dollar's got me a little nervous. And I know I'm, I shouldn't confuse the issue with facts. Bonds, okay, as I said a minute ago, okay, notice your pivot points here, right? Little pivot here, okay, little pivot here, falling pivots, land your life to the downside. Which way are bonds headed? Bonds are headed down, at least for now, okay? So that's not very pretty. NASDAQ composite, back above the 30, nothing magical about that, still falling, okay? And we've only had one little kiss and a pivot point on that moving average since january that's pretty impressive if you think about it take a look at the rusty now rusty's trying to bottom out in here but settle down beavis let's not get too excited 
because the rusty looks pretty ugly longer term, okay? So I wouldn't rush out and buy the rusty unless you're doing a day trade, okay? Because it still looks pretty ugly. Now it's chopping back and forth, so maybe there's no action at all to be taken there for now. Gold commodity, little pop today, nice little pullback to the, nice deep pullback to the EMA. I like trading pullbacks to the EMA. Same thing sort of happened with energy, although energy did dip below, but then it's back up, okay? Pivots to the upside here, okay? You're welcome. Right there, right there, higher pivots. As long as that continues to occur, we remain in the uptrend, okay? And as long as the net net price movement is higher than it was, we remain in an uptrend. The metals and mining look so much better than energies, but I like energies too, don't get me wrong. But notice metals and mining did a nice little kiss of that moving average, made a little pivot and took off again. Almost kissed it here, took off again, okay? What do we have? Higher highs, higher lows, simple as that. Consumer durables, not looking too pretty, downtrend. Lots and lots of areas look like that. Foods have been pretty ugly as of late. You would think to be a flight to safety. Now, drugs had a really good day today, as you can see. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet. But if they can kind of hang on here and keep on keeping on, I'm not opposed to buying the sector, okay? I'm long. Am I long energy? I'm long energy or energy related. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I got a shit ton of energy now that I think about it. Um, so I'm not afraid to go long, even though the market's questionable. Okay, good point. Uh, Jeff is saying the Russell sort of look like a, like a Darvis box, okay? Yeah, it's just making a box right here. If it takes out this box and then, you know, takes out this box, and, you know, then maybe we might be turning the corner. But let's not start kissing each other just yet. Biotech's still in a downtrend, although it's been chopping around in here as of late. Like anything, if you back the chart way, way out, wrong way, it's still in a pretty serious, albeit choppy, downtrend. Okay. Defense has been looking pretty good, but my big problem with defense, and I looked at uh, Northrop, Northrop, what's the name of it? Northrop Grumman, Grumman. I never know the names of these stocks. It's uh, N-O, NOC. I was going to say I know the symbols. No, I don't know the symbols. Uh, General Dynamics and quite a few others. Most of those just have like these two big breakout bars, and then they've pulled back. And I prefer a, a pullback to be a little bit more orderly in the trend up as opposed to just one or two melt up days like that as you go through these sectors there's manufacturing there's leisure you can just go through them at your leisure uh-huh nice little segue there and you can see most remaining downtrends you can see software a little kiss of the moving average what do we have here once again falling highs landry light etc Sibis have gotten really choppy as of late, but falling highs there too, falling pivot points too. Okay, John wants to take a look at IPI. IPI I like, I was looking at that one earlier. It's a pretty deep pullback, and this is crazy. This is, I remember this stock years ago being an old, stodgy, boring company. This is what, uh, fertilizer, okay? A fertilizer stock with an HV of 92. Isn't that crazy? But you can see deep, deep, deep retracement. And it's like, if you look at the price on the side, it's like, it's it's ridiculous. And you almost, you almost think that, wow, that's just too deep, too crazy. And it's pretty deep, but I like, a lot of people got knocked out of this thing. And this thing, it's kind of like the rubber bands being pulled down. If, if, I know it's a big if, and it's like, of course, Dave, but if some buying comes back into it, I think it could pop right back up. So yeah, I like that one, John, I do. POA showing a bow tie on a daily with meta stock off a 52 week low. Uh, this is kind of wide and loose and choppy and you got a lot of overhead supply and it's only a $1 stock and it's uh, pretty light in volume, only or less than 400,000, I mean, it's less than $400,000. I mean, a relatively small trader could buy a lot of this and push it around a little bit. I would be careful on that one, okay? Um, I kind of hear you super long-term on a weekly. It's kind of bottoming out. But I, I think I'd pass on that. I think it's a little dangerous. Uh, Brad, I'm not going to talk about that one because that is the setup for tomorrow for the trading service, or one of the two 
And yeah, I'll give you a high five on that. If you, uh, I know you're too young to have children. You might be saving for your children's education. Put a put 100% of your money into that one stock. <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding. But yeah, I fully agree with that one. Good, good call. You're uh, you're in my head. All right, any more stock picks, real quick? Got time for a couple more. Going once, going twice. <laughs> Uh, all right obviously i want to thank all you guys and girls for being here tonight i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule anything unanswered davelander.com slash contact everybody else obviously just bring it up in the facebook group everybody have a great weekend if we'll talk between now and then thank you so much again and may the trend be with you